This is the WOW Signal Podcast, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. Welcome. This is your host, Paul Carr. This is the inaugural episode of Season 3 of the WOW Signal Podcast, after a long and largely unintended hiatus. And this episode will actually refer back to the last episode of Season 2, as I'll explain in a moment. The large hiatus has been largely due to the energy and time required to get the Unseen podcast going, which is a spin-off of this podcast, although unscripted, unedited, and uns- and completely spontaneous discussion amongst a group of people, sometimes with a special guest, sometimes not. And that podcast, I hope you'll agree, has been worth all the trouble. It's up to episode 25 now. For more information, go to unseenpodcast.com. This episode was a result of an announcement made back in July. This is September 20th when I'm recording this. In July, it was announced that a Russian billionaire named Yuri Milner was donating a a large sum of money to the SETI enterprise in general, in particular $100 million over 10 years, much of the money is to be spent on increased dedicated SETI telescope time. Um, as we will hear in just a moment, that's split amongst three telescopes. Also, research and development and data analysis. So, in the last episode of Season 2, I had discussed SETI at the Square Kilometer Array with Andrew Zemian, a young scientist at UCAL Berkeley who's working on SETI. Andrew explained that the SKA would be an important new advance in SETI because of its sensitivity. But that was before this big influx of money was announced. In late July, the Unseen podcast covered, it was, I believe, episode 17 covered this announcement, uh, but we didn't really have any expert advice at that point. We ne- I really needed to contact Andrew, who's listed as one of the leaders of the Breakthrough Initiative, what's called Breakthrough Listen. And Breakthrough Listen uh, is one of the Breakthrough Initiatives that Milner announced, as we'll discuss later. So Andrew, uh, I contacted him, and, and of course, being August... Uh, it's a bad time to contact someone who is in, working in a university. Uh, so I eventually got a hold of him, and he agreed now in September to appear on the on the Wow Signal and answer our questions about the Breakthrough Initiative. Thanks to Adam Synergy Smith, who's a frequent panelist and sometimes host on the Unseen Podcast, and also to Nick Nielsen, who's also an Unseen Podcast regular for come, helping me come up with some good questions for Andrew. Um, so thank you, guys. And we will now present my interview with Andrew Zemian, which was held on the 20th of September, 2015. Andrew, thank you for joining us on the Wow Signal again. Uh, we talked to you about back back in March about SETI at the Square Kilometer Array, and that's been a popular episode. But in July, there was an announcement that kind of got everybody's attention very quickly, 
at, with uh, the Breakthrough Listen initiative, and you are listed as the, one of the leadership of that. So I thought I should call you up again and make sure we get the straight dope on what's really going on there. Uh, the media accounts were pretty broad, and we have questions. So. <laughs> Well, um, thank you, thank you very much for having me back, Paul. It's it's great to be on the the Wow Signal podcast again. And you know, you mentioned that you and and some of your listeners got very excited about that announcement. I can tell you that we were very excited about that announcement as well. So um, it's been an incredibly exciting ride so far, and we're just absolutely th thrilled um, to be doing uh, such an amazing new new SETI project. Actually, a, a series of projects. Um, under the Breakthrough Listen initiative. All right now, let's break it down a little bit. Uh, the Breakthrough Listen, as I understand it, consists of lots more telescope time at two major radio telescopes and some technology development. Is that that? That's right. So it's a one hundred million dollar ten year initiative, um, and and the kind of broad brush description of it is a project that's going to conduct the most sensitive and intensive um, and, and truly comprehensive searches for extraterrestrial intelligence that humanity has ever undertaken. Um, and there are three telescopes that are a part of the initiative. Two of them are radio telescopes, the Green Bank Telescope uh, in the United States here in, uh, in West Virginia, and uh, the Parkes Telescope, which is in Australia, uh, another radio telescope, and then also an optical telescope in California called the Automated Planet Finder. So that's uh, where in California is that? Is that that's on Mount Wilson, or no? it's at the Lick Observatory? Oh, the Lick Stanford. Observatory. Okay, right, right. Okay. Now, um, of those those projects are they, they announced that Pete Warden, who's well-known guy uh, was appointed the chairman, but who's really going to be running it day to day? Uh, well, we have a, a fantastic team. Um, uh, Pete Warden is the um, is the the director of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation um, and is the 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 chair of, of really all the the breakthrough the breakthrough initiatives. Um, but in, including Pete, we have a, a, a wonderful team of of scientists and um, and and. And, and thinkers and um, and leaders that are uh, business people uh, that are that are going to be playing a uh, very critical roles in um, in the breakthrough initiatives and and that includes uh, a number of scientists at Berkeley uh, Professor Jeff Marcy and uh, Dan Wertheimer who was one of the founders of the SETI at Home project um, Yuri Milner himself um, uh, Carl Sagan's widow Annie Druyan. Um, is is one of the the leaders of the the breakthrough message initiative, which is a a companion initiative that's going to look at the at the question of constructing a message that we might eventually send um, to a to an advanced civilization that we that we identify. So it's a really a, a fantastic a fantastic team with lots of, of varied expertise, um, and that that team is going to be very important to successfully carrying out these these initiatives, including breakthrough listen. Right now, what what's your role in, in that? Uh, well, at, at at Berkeley, we're we're playing a very a very key role in the the scientific data analysis for Breakthrough Listen, and also for the technical development. Um, one of the big challenges in a, a radio SETI experiment, especially, is dealing with the massive amounts of data that can be produced by the telescope. So, just to give you some idea of of that. Um, at the Green Bank Telescope, if we're operating in the, the full data rate mode, if we're looking at as much of the radio spectrum as the, as the telescope can deliver to us, our instruments are, are producing something like 350 gigabits per second. That's 350 billion bits of, of information every second, which is just absolutely a, a massive data rate. That's, that's something like uh, 75 Blu-ray movies every every second, um, so it's a it's a huge amount of of data, and so in order to process all of that data, we have to build um, very um, high performance, innovative uh, digital signal processing systems, and that's actually something that we have a lot of expertise at Berkeley in, even outside of SETI. 
We have a group at Berkeley called the Center for Astronomy, Signal Processing, and Electronics Research. Um, and it's actually more of a, of a collaboration, a, an international collaboration than a, than a center, but, but it was began at Berkeley nonetheless. And, and what we do in that group is we build um, very high-performance uh, signal processing systems for all kinds of radio astronomy. And we do it using commodity hardware. So by commodity hardware, I mean consumer hardware, the same kind of computer servers that are used for websites and network switches that are used for commercial telecommunications and even graphics processing units that maybe some of your listeners have in their home computers for, for playing video games. We, we build high-performance radio astronomy instruments out of that technology, and it, it enables us to do it very inexpensively. Uh, and that's that's one of the the key roles that Berkeley is going to play in the project is is building the the instruments that we'll use to actually actually do the experiment and record the data. How do you get all that data from Green Bank to Berkeley? Is that um, well? So that's that's a great question. Um, so the first thing that our our instruments do is is they cut the data rate way down. So we just can't store um, you know hundreds of petabytes of data. A month, which is sort of the the scale of of data that we would be be collecting um, if we if we stored all of it. So we have to cut the data rate down. Um, so we perform various um, signal detection um, uh, processes on the data. We we run signal detection algorithms on the data, and we only pick out the the individual signals or little little pieces of the radio spectrum that contain signals that look interesting to us, and we only record those. So the kind of first step of a, of a typical radio SETI instrument is to cut the data rate down by a factor of 100 or 1,000 uh, or maybe even more. Um, and then we store those data on storage that's actually at the observatory. Uh, because we usually don't have very, very high data rate network links to our telescopes because they're oftentimes very far away from population centers um, to, get, to get away from our own technology. Uh, we, we have to store the data at the observatory. And when we want to move a lot of that data back to a place like Berkeley or another, another supercomputing center, usually we actually do that with hard disks and airplanes. Huh. Uh, it's more efficient to, to move it that way than to, than to try to use a slow network link. Hmm. Now, uh, the, uh, so uh, can you give us some a sense of what proportion of this this money will be spent on observing time versus technology development versus data analysis or, or a rough estimate of that? I, it's, it's hard for me to say, um, but I, I think, you know, roughly, um, you know, one third, one third, one third is, is probably about right. Uh, you know, all three of the things that, that you just talked about are, are very important for a successful um, SETI observing program. You you absolutely need access to the largest telescopes in the world. Um, this is the kind of signals that we're looking for are very, very weak, we think. Uh, and so we need the most sensitive telescopes that, that, we can, that we can find. And that generally means very, very large apertures, very large diameters uh, of the telescopes. Uh, so we, we need access to those facilities. And that's, uh, that's absolutely a, a requirement for the searches that we do. Uh, we also need specialized instruments because SETI is somewhat of a of a boutique field within astronomy. Most of the time, when large telescopes are built, they don't include a SETI observing capability in the sort of design of the telescope. So when we go to a telescope and we want to do a a SETI search, oftentimes we have to to bring our own equipment. Um, and so developing the instrumentation that's, that's required is very, very important. We, we have to have that. Um, and then, of course, you know, perhaps the most important of all of these things is, as I said, they're all important, but maybe this is, is the most important of all of them, is, is people to actually look at the data and to actually do the, the scientific data analysis. And, and Breakthrough Listen is going to fund all of those components. Now, uh, on your, a lot of your observing that you've done in the past at Berkeley, you've use something called SETI at home to get volunteer uh, help with analyzing the data. Will SETI at home be part of Breakthrough Listen? A absolutely. Um, any SETI at home participant will be able to, to download data from 
any of the, the radio telescopes that are a part of, of Breakthrough Listen and participate in the data analysis um, of, the, of the project um, using their, their home computer uh, in the same way that, that SETI at Home has, has operated for some time with data from the, the Arecibo telescope. And we're hopeful to, to add some new features to SETI at Home. So we'd like people to be able to engage with the, the observations that we're performing a, a little bit more richly than maybe they've been able to in the past. So that could include capabilities like selecting data from a particular telescope that you'd like to analyze or a particular part of the sky or maybe even a part of the radio spectrum that you believe is the best place to search for extraterrestrial intelligence for, for whatever reason. So um, we, we'd like to add some, some capabilities to SETI at home as well uh, as a part, of, a part of Breakthrough Listen. And I think more um, information on that will be, will be forthcoming in the, in, the coming, in the coming months. Great. Uh, I hope so. I'd like to participate myself. Uh, the... Uh... Now I have a question. I have uh, I went out and asked listeners for questions, and I got some good ones. Oh, fun! Uh, Great. Uh, this is from Adam Smith in the United Kingdom. He says, "Will the Breakthrough Initiative allow for broadband searches of wavelengths not previously monitored?" Um, well, yes, Adam. That is a phenomenal question. Um, we're going to search more of the radio spectrum. Uh, than we've ever searched before in SETI experiments. And the reason we're able to do that uh, is because we have instruments that ac can actually process instantaneously a much larger chunk of the radio spectrum um, than, than we've previously been able to, to analyze. So I can sort of give you a quantitative measure of that. Typically in our, our previous SETI experiments, we could analyze a few hundred megahertz, a few hundred million hertz or hundred million radio channels uh, of, of data in our experiments. But with Breakthrough Listen, we're going to be able to look at up to 10 billion hertz, uh, so 10 gigahertz of the, of the radio spectrum. Um, and because we can observe so much more quickly, that means we can, we can cover more of the radio spectrum in a, in a fixed amount of time. And I think there's something with respect to the amount of, of spectrum we're going to be able to cover. Uh, there's something, I think, very philosophically, um, if not scientifically, very profound about Breakthrough Listen. And that is for our targeted observations of nearby stars and nearby galaxies, we're actually going to be able to cover the entire chunk of radio spectrum that's known as the terrestrial microwave window. So this is a term that maybe some of your listeners have heard before. This is a, a, a region of the radio spectrum between about 500 megahertz um, and 10 or 15 gigahertz that has relatively low noise uh, relative to the, to the galactic background and also the, the absorption and emission from our own atmosphere. So it's historically a, a part of the radio spectrum that's been suggested it's very, very, that's a very, very good place to do radio SETI experiments. And we're going to be able to cover that entire band uh, for our targeted observations. And that's something that's never been done before. Right. Now, another question that Adam had and, I, and other listeners as well was, uh, you know, what we see in the, in the uh, public information so far is that Green Bank and Parks radio telescopes are involved. Uh, what about the uh, square kilometer array will that ever become part of Breakthrough Listen? Um, so, uh, so as many of your listeners probably know, uh, the square kilometer array is an international collaboration to try to build a, a radio telescope with a square kilometer of collecting area. So, one square kilometer would make such a telescope uh, have about fifteen times the collecting area of our largest radio telescopes that we have here on Earth. And that amount of collecting area would actually make the telescope so sensitive that it would be the first radio telescope that could detect uh, the omnidirectional leakage radiation from an Earth-like civilization, a uh, human-like civilization on an Earth-like planet uh, orbiting around some of our, our nearest neighbors. Um, with, with Breakthrough Listen, we are, are absolutely open to working with the, the best telescopes on the planet. And I think working with uh, with the square kilometer array uh, would be a would be a great thing uh, for for breakthrough listen. 
Um, and we'll, we'll see what, what happens in the future. Okay. Uh, now, uh, we had a, a, a listener, uh, his name is Nick Nielsen, who's one of the Centauri dreams bloggers. Uh, and Nick was interested in sort of the organizational questions. Uh, how, how does this organization going to be managed and formed and, and how does the money get, uh, get dispersed is it going to be berkeley or is it going to be some other uh a unique organization it would probably i would probably have a better answer for you for that question if you asked it in um in six months i see um you know with 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 breakthrough listen we're going to be using radio telescopes all over the world and there will be researchers from all over the world uh that are going to be engaging in in this work um, and the specific financial structure of, of how the, the money will be allocated um, has not been determined. Um, there will be something called a, the Breakthrough Listen Advisory Board, uh, which will, as the, the name seems to indicate, will have an ad advisory role in all of the, the Breakthrough Listen projects. Uh, and that will be made up of uh, a, a panel of very distinguished um, astronomers and, again, thinkers and business people from all over the world uh, that will that will evaluate uh, the proposed programs and breakthrough listen and our uh, our successes and 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 um, maybe our setbacks and and make suggestions about about ways that we can improve the program. But there there hasn't been um, any specific decisions made on um on on where all of the the money is is going uh so to be determined is the answer okay yeah. and uh, nick also wanted to know uh, if any of the funds are going to be used for uh education and public outreach a absolutely yeah I, you know seti has a remarkable ability to spark the the interest of um of of scientists and the, and the general public alike and i you know, I can speak sort of personally, and I can also speak based on my experience with other scientists that work in the field. We we work in SETI because we share the same incredible awe and wonder when we look up at the night sky and we wonder whether there might be other life out there. And so, you know, because we I think have that that kinship with with the rest of humanity in, in terms of the way that we feel about about SETI. It's very important to us to to communicate that with um you know with public audiences and with scientific audiences. And I think that's that's why you find people like Jeff Marcy and Dan Wertheimer and Jill Tarter and Seth Shostak uh so frequently speaking um at at, at public public conferences and events is because they they very much enjoy um, talking about about the science that they do, and and are incredibly exciting um, excited about it. And and I I certainly feel the the same way about that. So um, I know I know Yuri Milner and the the Breakthrough Prize Foundation, Pete Warden. They they absolutely feel the same way. And so a, a certainly a a big part of the Breakthrough Listen initiative will be um, communicating our work to the public, and and moreover. All of the data that we collect will be made public. All of the software and hardware that we build will all be open source. So we're very much committed to, to having an, an open um, and inclusive science project that, that engages everyone from sort of a, you know, someone in the general public that just wants to hear what's going on to, to maybe someone who's an amateur astronomer and might want to, you know, learn a little bit more about the specifics of where we're pointing the telescopes, even to someone who is maybe a, an engineer or a software developer and has some ideas about about ways that we might improve our, our algorithms, uh, having an opportunity to, to actually engage in um, in data analysis with, with the data that we collect. Okay, I have uh, another question from Adam Smith. Uh, and it's a pretty broad one, but maybe we can break it down a bit. It says, perhaps the biggest challenge lies in developing an observing strategy to make the best use of the available funds. Will a new observing strategy be developed that will target potentially interesting star systems and galaxies? Um, well, yes. So Adam is is absolutely right. I wonder if Adam's an astronomer. Uh, um, he's he's a an astronomy enthusiast, I would say. Okay. Um, well, so so again, Adam is is absolutely right. Um, the the question of where we're going to point the telescope has been 
um, a, a rather key component, as one might imagine, in our discussions and plans, planning meetings uh, for, for Breakthrough Listen. Um, we haven't yet constructed a final observing catalog, uh, but it will certainly include um, many of the, the types of targets that, um, that anyone familiar with this field might, might guess that we would include, um, nearby stars, uh, stars that have known exoplanet systems, particularly stars that have exoplanet systems that, that transit their star, because that means that the orbital plane of the exoplanet system is edge-on relative to the Earth. And we know that our own civilization tends to have enhanced electromagnetic emission in our own ecliptic plane as we explore other planets in our solar system or we do um, radar observations of nearby asteroids. Many of those, those communications and emissions tend to happen in our own ecliptic plane. So if we, if we turn that around, and we imagine that we're viewing some distant system, uh, we would have a greater likelihood of perhaps detecting the civilization if we observe systems that are edge-on um, relative to the Earth. So, so those systems will play a role. Uh, nearby galaxies as well, the, the advantage of observing nearby galaxies is that you can get many, many stars, uh, many hundreds of millions of stars in your telescope beam uh, all at once. So you can observe a lot of stars very, very quickly. And there's, there's a, a big unknown in SETI, uh, which is the, the so-called luminosity function of extraterrestrial transmitters. Now, that's kind of a technical term, but it's pretty easy to understand. And basically, we don't have any idea what the number of civilizations there are that are transmitting at each luminosity level or power level. So we don't know if there's lots and lots of civilizations that are emitting radio signals that are kind of at the same level as the Earth that are relatively weak, or if maybe there are a, a few very, very advanced civilizations that are producing radio signals that are much, much, much brighter uh, than, than we have on the Earth. And depending on, on sort of the, the distribution of those two different types of civilizations, that changes what your observing strategy would be. So when we do a, a SETI experiment, because we don't know anything about that luminosity function, we try, to, we try to sample as many different sort of parts of the luminosity function as we can. So we spend a certain amount of our time on the very nearby stars, so we would be sensitive to, to weaker signals. Uh, but we also try to spend some time on particular lines of sight from the Earth that give us lots and lots of stars within our, our telescope beam so that we might be sensitive to rarer uh, brighter transmissions. Okay. Uh, so uh, we should stay tuned on the observing strategy. There'll be, be more to come. Okay. Yeah. I, again, you know, we, we have some, some sort of some draft um, observing catalogs, um, you know, and, and it, they include, you know, the million nearest stars to the to the earth uh the the hundred closest galaxies um particular kind of lines of sight within our own galaxy that are that are interesting to us for one reason or another the galactic center um these kinds of things but we don't have a definite observing schedule uh for our first semester of observations yet um but but when we do i would be happy to to chat with you again um and and briefly walk through that with your with your listeners right um and uh, now, as more exoplanets are discovered, they'll, they'll be added to your catalog, I would presume. Yeah, that's, that's right. I, you know, the real message, and I'm sure you've had people come on and, and talk about this, the real message from, from exoplanet work in the last couple of years has not been the, the individual discovery of particular exoplanets, although that's very interesting, and, and we love to hear about uh, the, the newest, most Earth-like exoplanet that's been discovered in the Kepler field or, or elsewhere with, with other searches. The, the real message has been statistical, and that is that planets are incredibly common. Most of the stars in our galaxy have planets. Something like 10 to 20 percent of them have an Earth-like planet. Uh, so we don't really need to look too far uh, for, there to, for, for there to be a um, an Earth-like planet orbiting a, a, a nearby star, uh, and we don't necessarily have to have to know of of explicitly that there is a planet uh, orbiting a star because statistically 
we know that that they're there um, again from from the Kepler mission and from and from other types of work. All of that said, I think the most Earth-like planets uh, and the most solar system-like exoplanet systems will continue to rank very highly uh, in our in our SETI searches. Right um, now, I don't know if this has much to do with breakthrough listen or not, but I I if I have a a radio astronomer on the phone, I have to ask this question, which is, uh, I wanted to get your, your thinking on the, on the observations of the fast radio bursts and what extent you, that, uh, you'll be looking at those at all. Um, well, fast radio bursts are, are incredibly exciting. Um, these are, a, a, a population of, of sources that have been discovered in the last, um, eight years or so. Um, that are are impulsive um, one off bursts of of electromagnetic radiation that last for only a a couple of milliseconds and they 're never seen to repeat and they appear to be coming from a very very long way away, so far away that we don 't really have any theoretical ideas as to as to what might have might have produced them and the and the only ideas that we do have are are very much uh, very much conjecture. Um, the these these sources remain, even though you know they've been they've been discovered for about the last eight years. They remain very very enigmatic. Um, there are many questions about about these sources. There are some astronomers that believe that these might be some form of interference that might be coming from our own atmosphere or or maybe even our own our own technology uh, I would say that that's a minority opinion today um, there are other astronomers that believe that maybe they are actually astrophysical but they're not coming from near as far as they appear to be coming from so these many of these sources appear to be coming from um, hundreds of millions of, of parsecs away well well outside of of our galaxy at at what are called cosmological distances, very, very large distances in the universe. Um, some, some astronomers believe that maybe they're coming from within our own galaxy and they only appear to be coming from a, a very long distance away because of some, some physics, uh, some particular astrophysical process that, that maybe we haven't seen before. Um, and yet there, there are a number of, of astronomers, and I would say that this is probably the majority opinion today, that believe that these sources do indeed represent some cosmological population of very, very distant, hyperluminous sources somehow um, that are producing uh, very, very bright individual radio pulses um, for a you know by, via some mechanism that we just that we just don't understand yet, but uh, but again the the jury's out. Um, there have been suggestions that these pulses might originate with an advanced technology. I I do not believe that they do, and I would say that that most astronomers do not, if not all astronomers, do not believe that they do. And there's a pretty there's a pretty easy reason for that, and and that is that these sources appear to be um, distributed almost isotropically on the sky. So they don't really tend to come from the galactic plane as much. This is kind of a detail, but they come from many, many different directions on the sky. So what we would expect if there was a, a, a very advanced civilization that was producing some kind of um, you know, radio, radio pulsed emission that they were using to signal other intelligences that, that they would be only coming from, they would only be sending that from one place um, and not from from many many different different places, so these these sources have all the all the hallmarks, in my opinion, of being um, astrophysical in nature, natural astrophysical sources. Um, and again, whether they're coming from you know relatively nearby or or very far away is is again a bit of a detail. But we don't see any evidence that that these are um, uh, that, that these these pulses are coming from. Uh, from advanced intelligences, so so all of that said, um, you know these these sources remain very very interesting. Even though they're not necessarily interesting from a SETI perspective, they're interesting from a from a radio astronomy perspective. And we will have lots of telescope time on a couple of telescopes that are very very good uh, at finding these fast radio bursts. So we will absolutely be be searching for them. Right. Uh, good. Um, now. 
I did get a couple of questions uh, that are not really about Breakthrough Listen, but about more about messaging. Uh, okay. There's been a fair bit written and said lately about uh, actively messaging uh, into the galaxy or beyond, even beyond the galaxy with radio, using radio transmitters. Uh, we, I was wondering if, if you had any thoughts on where that's going, uh, not just in the breakthrough initiatives, but also uh, in general. Um, well, so I can sort of speak kind of briefly about, about, about this. So with breakthrough message, um, this is the, the breakthrough initiative that's going to look at, at how you would compose a message, uh, to an advanced intelligence. Um, there is absolutely zero commitment to transmit a message. Um, there are no plans to transmit any of the messages that will be will be constructed. Um, as you, I think, kind of hinted to in your in your question, um, this is a very controversial topic. Uh, whether, yes. Whether or not um, human beings um, should should be transmitting uh, messages to to unknown unknown civilizations. Um, I would say the majority opinion in our group at Berkeley is that this is this is not a very good idea, and in fact, um, several people from Berkeley were signatories to a a brief um, one page uh, statement that we released, kind of um, uh, coincidentally with the AAAS um, American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting a couple of months ago. That maybe some of your your readers read Elon Musk um, also also signed this and um, a, a number of other other scientists uh, and and our our opinion is that um, before there's before there's any transmitting of, of messages to any advanced intelligences we we really should have a have a discussion about uh, about that on, on kind of a worldwide basis um, and this is a you know, this is a, an activity that potentially would have an impact on on all the inhabitants of of this planet, and so we we owe it to all the inhabitants of of this planet to um, to certainly get their get their opinion and 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 have a debate about it before we anyone goes off and, and unilaterally um, engages in in any of these activities. I think the the reasons why people object to um, to transmitting these messages varies. And, and indeed, the reason why people actually would send the messages uh, varies quite a lot as well. I think, you know, in, in some cases, um, these are simply PR exercises, either, um, either PR exercises for a, for a company uh, or an observatory or PR exercises for an individual scientist. Um, but but the, I think the reasons why people object to them you know they they kind of come in a number of different categories. Some people believe that um, that truly believe that that these transmissions might represent a, an existential risk to humanity. Um, the idea that there might be some advanced intelligence out there that doesn't know that we're here will discover that we're here because we send a, a transmission and then we'll come and want to destroy our planet or mine our resources or steal our technology or our, you know, art or, or whatever else. I, I, I personally do not believe that that's a, that that's a big, a big risk. Um, my, my objection to it, it personally is that, you know, we have very limited resources in, in science and, and certainly in SETI. And so we should put our resources in the scientific experiments that are most likely to to succeed and and produce results, and there just isn't any um, significant scientific merit uh, in my mind to engaging in these um, in these medi activities. We we see on our own planet, and I think we have reason to believe that this is true. Uh, or may be true generically that that technology begets technology that that once a, a technology starts to take off it's possible to build more and more advanced technologies so technological progression proceeds fairly quickly and our own technology is very very young relative to the age of the of the galaxy and the age of the of the universe so it's likely that other technologies that we might encounter are are far older than ours and and far more advanced than we are, and what that means is is that they probably have um, 
observing capabilities, remote sensing capabilities, radio telescopes that are much more advanced than ours, that have much larger collecting areas and are much, much more sensitive. And that means that these technologies, these other civilizations, have probably already detected uh, that, that Earth is here. And there's really no reason for us to send any, any high-powered transmissions towards them because they've already detected uh, out, out to what's permitted by the, the speed of light our own early uh, radio and, and television transmissions. And moreover, if your desire is to say something in particular to some advanced civilization that were out there, you needn't use the largest radio telescopes and the most powerful transmitters. If these advanced civilizations are out there um, and, and they're, they're looking at the Earth, all you need is a, a run-of-the-mill television transmitter or, or maybe even a ham radio antenna uh, to, to signal them. Um, and in, in that case, I think you wouldn't be making near as many people angry about what you were doing, and you could speak to your heart's content about whatever it is that you wanted to say to them. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I have one last question, which is sort of the meta question I ask everybody is, um, what's the question that you don't get that you wish you did about the Breakthrough Initiatives? Um, what is the question? that I don't get, um, that I wish I got. Um, uh, well, I guess I do, I, I have an answer to that. And I think it's a question that I actually do get, but I don't get it very often. Um, and that is, uh, you know, I want to, may, the question maybe would be something like, um, how, how do I, how do I get involved in, in experimental SETI research? I, I'm a high school student or I'm an undergraduate or I'm a graduate student and I want to get involved in, um, in SETI research. I think I, I would love to get that question more often because SETI is a, is a very fragile field. There aren't very many people that are, that are doing it and, and we need more, more scientists. I think someone made a, a very, a, a reporter actually made a very astute observation when the Breakthrough Listen initiatives, uh, initiative was announced, um, and that was something like, well, Andrew, this is, this is really fantastic that you have you know, all, of this, all of this funding and you're going to be able to do all of these great SETI experiments, but, but who are you going to hire to do this work? I mean, there's only you know, a dozen people that know anything about SETI you know, a, a, in a you know, kind of a professional context on the, on the whole planet. You know, where are you, where are you going to get these people that are going to do this research? And, and that was a very fair question. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're bootstrapping a field. Um, you know, SETI's been around for a little while, but because of the very significant uh, funding ups and downs that the field has had, it's sort of created a situation where we don't have a really vibrant stream of, of young researchers coming into the field, undergraduates that are going to graduate school, graduate students that are doing their thesis with a SETI component, um, and then going on to do postdoctoral work. We, we absolutely need that, as any scientific field does. Um, you know, graduate students and, and postdocs are really, um, in my mind, very much the lifeblood of a, of a scientific, you know, program. They're, they're the ones that write the code and, you know, stay up till three o'clock in the morning and, and do the, the really, really hard work. Um, and we need, we need more of those folks. So I'd like to, I'd like to have more people ask, um, you know, how can they, how can they get involved in, in SETI research professionally? Because, because we need them. All right. Now, if, if a, say a young graduate student comes to you and a uh, first year graduate student says, I want to be a SETI astronomer, what would you tell him? Well, as, as an undergraduate, I think the, the most important thing um, that you can do is learn as much mathematics, physics, and computer science, and perhaps electrical engineering as you can uh, for the first couple of years, um, and then get involved in, in research. Uh, the sort of standard response that, that we get to, um, to the, the question of going on to, to graduate school in astronomy at Berkeley when, when we ask it, I was an undergraduate at Berkeley, is, is you know, go on the, the website for the university that you're at or maybe a nearby university. If you, if you happen to be at a, at, a, at a school where there's not a lot of basic research going on, find some research that's going on near you and send out some emails and, and ask to get involved in, in research. And it doesn't necessarily have to be, have to be SETI research. I think a, a number of different, um, different you know, research experiences would be very valuable 
uh, for eventually working in working in SETI, uh, and just try to try to prepare yourself as as best you can. Um, and then when you apply to graduate school, there are now thankfully um, in the last in the last year or so, and, and certainly in the next couple of years, there are going to be many more universities where there will be researchers working on SETI. Um, seek out those those universities and and try to get involved in a in a SETI research project. And I think you know SETI is something people that are involved in this field sometimes sometimes argue a little bit on whether it's a it's a good field to to dedicate yourself to completely. Um, some people, um, Frank Drake notably, has has said that he thinks that that SETI is something that maybe would be would be better as a Kind of a part-time um, research uh, kind of research area rather than a full-time research area because it's in, it's important to to build you know a career and scientific credibility around uh, around field fields that that more people are working in and I think I agree with that to to some extent um, I also think that it's possible to spend quite a lot of your time on on SETI if you're very much uh, very much committed to it. So there is a, a range of, of potential uh, potential involvement that that people could have. And and I think that um, you know that that sort of message is important to, to get out there that um, if you're a if you're a new graduate student or a you know second or third year graduate student and you're interested in in working on a on a SETI project um, there, there are opportunities to, to do that that would not necessarily alter your, you know, your, your career path if, if you happen to be more interested in exoplanets or supernova or cosmology or, or some, other, some other field of astronomy or physics. Okay, well, well Andrew, uh, I want to thank you very much for enlightening us on how Breakthrough Initiative is going to work. And we are very much looking forward to at getting rolling. And hopefully we can talk to you in a few months or a year or so and, and uh, check and see how things are going. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for having me, Paul. It's, it's always great to, to chat with you, and um, I, I hope to speak with you soon. Yes, I hope so. Well, thanks a lot. All right. Thanks, Paul. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, I'd like to thank Andrew for spending some time with us and explaining the Breakthrough Listen Initiative. I feel a bit enlightened on it now, and I understand some of the f- fine points that we were hoping to get our questions answered on. There's still a lot more to come. As he pointed out, the observing strategy is still in development, and also he's still uh, they're still working on the, the management plan for the initiative. Uh, although I think it's in good hands with people like Pete Warden, who have experience managing large, complex organizations. So uh, the next step is going to be the actual observations, and we'll just have to stand by and watch. Although, if you want to participate in SETI at home, that's easy to do, and I'll have a link in the show notes where you can do that. And as he, as Andrew announced, that there will be some participation by SETI at home and the data analysis of the Breakthrough Initiative. So that should be exciting. I, I, it's my fantasy that the, the first real signal will be detected by some person running their spare computer in their basement. Maybe me. Why not? So uh, thanks to them and thanks to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Adam and Nick for helping me come up with good questions. So that's where we leave it for this episode. This is episode one of season three. Uh, Before we go, I'd like to just say a few things. First of all, I really hope you will subscribe to the Wow Signal. I'll have a link in. If you go to WowSignalPodcast.com, there's a link there that helps you subscribe. How you subscribe depends upon what you use as a podcatcher, and a podcatcher is whatever software you use to listen to podcasts. So if you're listening to one now, presumably you have that software. Uh, it might be iTunes on your desktop. It might be something much more obscure. Uh, I use Pocket Cast on Android, and I'm happy with that. So 
whatever you use, we could probably help you figure out how to subscribe to our podcast. We are on iTunes. Uh, we are on lots of other services as well, Stitcher, uh, Miro, and Pocket Casts, among others. So please subscribe. That way you get the podcast delivered right to your device as soon as it's out, within hours of me pressing publish, and you'll get it. Or you can come to our blog at wowsignalpodcast.com. Each episode has its own blog post, and there's a little player there. You can just press play and listen right then and there. The other thing I'd like you to remind you about is that we would like your support and help. There's a couple ways you can do that. One of them, the best way, is to share the podcast with your friends and followers uh, and also to write us an iTunes review. If you want to help financially, you have a little bit of extra spare cash you've already given to all the charities that are more deserving than we are, which is you know just a few, uh, then you can go to patreon.com slash wowsignal. And we don't ask you for much, just a dollar or so an episode. And we will thank you on air. And in fact, right now, I would like to thank Tara Mulder, Yoan, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Yoan McAvoy. He says it's a Welsh name. Of course, I can't pronounce Welsh uh, as much as I would like to. Duff Deal. And of course, Stephen Fernandez, who I may have thanked before, but thanks again, Stephen and Tara and Yoan and Duff for your patronage to the WOW Signal. These folks are helping to defray the costs of producing the WOW Signal. And if you go to patreon.com slash WOWSignal, you'll see what my goals are that go way beyond simply covering the financial costs of doing this. So I appreciate if you do that and add your name to the list of patrons. I I also uh, am a Patreon supporter of people like Zach Wienersmith, uh, who does the... Saturday morning breakfast cereal cartoon and a few others. So let's just help each other out as best we can show that we understand things can be a little bit expensive and try to help out. The other thing you can do that would really help this podcast would be to let us know what you think, whether it's about what Andrew Zemian just said or anything else that we cover or about the podcast, about me, about the format, about the music, about the cover art, anything that that you want to either change or improve or think is great, let us know. And we'll take all that into account. We will read every single email or blog post. So you can go to unseen pod, sorry, go to wowsignalpodcast.com and comment directly on the blog post for this episode. Or you can send me an email at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com, and those will all be read, I assure you. Uh, also, we have a Google Plus listeners community, and we also have a subreddit for listeners. All that is available to you to let us know what you think, give us your ideas, who should be on the show, what, what topics we should cover. And there's also a new way to let us know what you think, which is to join the Unseen Podcast panel pool. To do that, go to unseenpodcast.com and click on FAQ, frequently asked questions. It'll tell you everything you need to know about how to get into the panel pool. It's pretty simple. Uh, all you need is a cheap microphone, a pair of headphones, and a computer, and you can be in the panel pool. Uh, if, you, if you're nice to everybody, if you engage in a civil way, you'll be invited back. So, uh, that said I think we're ready to wrap up episode one of season three of the wow signal I'm glad to be back in the saddle as far as the wow signal is concerned I hope there will be many more episodes it won't always be me as the host but uh, that's exactly what I want I don't want it to be just about me or my ideas so let us know what you think send us a review on iTunes and we'll be back soon with some more information about the answer not the answers but better questions to who's there this is Paul Carr and I'll see you again soon
been the wow signal a podcast produced by the dream of the open channel please visit wowsignalpodcast.com for more information all music presented on this podcast is either creative commons or is presented with the permission of the artist the wow signal is distributed under the creative commons attribution share alike license